Um, so yes, I'm going to tell you about the uniqueness results for rational equivariant pain theory. Um, but before we get there, um, I want to mention that um, the second part of this talk, so the, the uniqueness results are going to be joint work with um, Anna-Marie Baumann, Christy Hazel, Justin and Fischak, and Claude May. And those were all published in 2022. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a motivation. Uh, we're going to talk through algebraic models, different levels of commutativity, and algebraic models for those different levels of commutativity. We're going to join those things together. So let's start with a little bit of motivation for algebraic models. So for rational topological spaces, um, we know that certain algebraic models were given by Quillen and Sullivan. If I move to the world of rational spectra, the algebraic model, so the rational chain complexes with a projected model structure, was given by, um, well, I should put Sir here. He didn't really do that that way, but his computations actually imply that result um, in a certain form. I should give um, attributes to uh, Brooke Shipley. Mm. Who did that at the level of model categories, symmetric model, model categories? Um, today we're going to talk about <coughs> rational G spectra and the algebraic and algebraic model for that. I'm going to denote it by AG. And today for the whole talk, G is going to be a finite group. So, for compactly, the situation is much more complicated. We are going to talk about uh, finite groups only today. And we're not only going to talk about an algebraic model for rational G spectra, but we're also going to talk about um, what do we know and what we can deduce about algebraic models for different levels of commutative multiplications that we can see on this side. So before I get anywhere, let me tell you what I mean by different levels of commutativity on the left hand side. <coughs> so, we all know what does it mean to be commutative. I'm going to have an object with some multiplication, mu, and I can do a twist so commute those two copies, and I want such a diagram to commute. That's the usual classical set of commutativity. But now, what happens if x has a g-action? If x has a g-action, I can ask for such diagrams to commute for more elaborate towns than just a swap. I can ask for tau to act by some elements of g and swap at the same time. And now I can ask for various of those tiles for the multiplication mu to commute with various of those tiles. So the more tiles I'm going to impose, the more strict commutativity I'm going to get. Uh, if my multiplication in the equivariant world is going to commute only with those tiles, only with the swapping as classically, that's going to be the most naive level of commutativity, but there are more. So if, G, if X has a G action, we can ask for such a diagram to commute for more elaborate tasks. And that leads us to the notions of different levels of commutativity. So of course, this is the intuition that I wanted to present, but in homotopy theory we're never going to be working with strictly commutative objects. So, um, we relax strict commutativity, and whenever I say commutative, I really mean infinity, okay? So, associative 
and commutative up to all higher homotopies, coherent higher homotopies. So, um, when we work with uh, objects of this kind, the natural way to encode such, such structures is using operands. Okay, so let's have a look at the opera picture. What happens with opera? So I'm going to have a look at G topological spaces and topological spaces under the forgetful function. So I'm forgetting the G action. In topological spaces, I'm going to have an E infinity opera. And I mean, I can talk about that, and you two are going to be with the equivalent by a zigzag. So I can really talk about an E infinity, infinity opera. And now, what happens if I look at the pre image of all those operas in G topological spaces which forget down to E infinity? It turns out that I'm going to get a poset of operas on this side. It's going to have a minimal element and a maximal element. That's my concept. The mass are going out. <laughs> oh. So it's going to have a minimal element and a maximum element. The minimal one I'm going to call infinity one. And that, you should think about it as the most naive version of commutativity. So only the swaps. And this one I'm going to call infinity g. And this you should think about genuine, for the lack of a better name. Um, so that is going to be the maximal commutativity that is still going to forget down to E infinity classically. Okay? So, <coughs> Bloomberg and Hill, um, they proposed a definition of N infinity of Rad. They didn't define it that way, but that's going to be exactly um, corresponding to what I told you here. Um, they define an infinity operas, and those are going to be exactly the guys that forget down to E infinity after I forget the G action. So in a sense, they all deserve the name commutative, but they are actually going to be different in this equivalent setting, and also the algebras for them are going to be different in the equivalent setting. We're going to come back to that. I probably should mention that the first work on uh, different G operats, G infinity operats, was done by Constable and Weiner. Um, but they, they only worked with I think, linear isometries and perhaps the little disk. So, talking about linear isometries and the little disks, I'm going to give you examples of this and that. The intermediate ones are not going to be that important for the talk today, so I'm not going to really talk about the intermediate ones, but the, the most naive and the most genuine ones are going to be the ones that we're going to consider. Okay? So, E infinity 1, you can, for example, take um, a non equivariant E infinity operat and give it a trivial. G action. So this guy turns out to be as free as possible. It is going to map to all the others. And on the other hand, I'm going to have E infinity G, and this is as fixed um, as possible. I mean, there are some restrictions, right? I mean, the sigma n has to still act freely because it still has to forget down to the e infinity. So there are some restrictions on the fixed points, but it is as fixed as possible while still mapping to, while still forgetting to e infinity. And the examples of those things, you can take a universe u this is going to be a G universe. Here we go. And I can take the linear isometries operat on U. Um, that's one of the classical um, 
nicely geometric uh, construction, linear isometries upright, or I can take the little disc upright on you. By little disc, I don't mean two dimensional disc, I mean like the columnet going to infinity. So I really mean is this as a infinity upright. Uh, so this is going to be the little disc upright. So if we take u to be um, if we take u to be the trivial universe, both of those things are going to give us the e infinity one. So both of those constructions give us e infinity one. If I take u to be complete g universe, then both of these are going to give me e infinity g. But there is a warning: not every operat in this faucet is going to come from either of those two. Some of them are more exotic, let's just say. Okay, so the way I didn't give you the definition of a, an infinity um, makes it a little bit more difficult to state the first theorem that I wanted to state, but I still want to state it, so bear with me, it's going to be um, a little weird. Uh, this is down to Gutierrez and White, Rubin and Bonvente, Bonvente Pereira, independently. Um, so here comes the statement, an infinity operates um, exist whenever it can exist. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the little smiley face. Um, that's not how they phrased it, obviously. <laughs> um, so, the original definition of Bloomberg and Hill of an infinity operate uh, is uh, telling you that those are going to be the operates which have certain properties on the end level of your operate. Um, so you, those are going to be universal spaces for some families of subgroups. So you may ask, okay, so I can choose um, the family, the whole collection of families of subgroups, but of course this thing has to form an operate, so there are some composition maps that I have to have. So I'm saying those families that you've chosen are going to give you an operat whenever there are no obstructions for the composition. So if the composition can exist, it will exist. So, sorry for that phrasing. Um, okay, and a little remark here. Different, so among this person, different and infinity operas give different homotopy theories of algebras. So if I take an operand O and an O prime and they are not equivalent as an infinity operands, O algebras are going to have different homotopy theory than O prime algebras. And uh, for those of you that know, in G topological spaces, if you think about uh, algebras over some n infinity operate in G topological spaces, those guys are going to be characterized by the existence of certain <coughs> additive transfers. <coughs> on homotopy groups and in G spectra those algebras are going to be characterized by the existence of certain um, multiplicative norms. So the beginning of the sentence is the same. Uh, existence of certain multi multiplicative norms on how Before I get any further, I wanted to mention the work of my PhD student. So, Barrero gave a setting and defined the N infinity operand globally. So, in a global setting, global equivalent setting of orthogonal spaces of uh, Stefan Schreiber. 
Um, but this part of the talk is not for today, so he's somewhere in the audience, so if you want, you should, um, you should definitely talk to him about that. Uh, today we're going to work with one group at a time. Yeah? No, I was just saying finding for her, so <laughs> somewhere in the audience. <laughs> You can raise your hand, you know? Now no, Jesper wants to see you. Ah. <laughs> well done. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, today we're going to talk about algebraic models. So let's, um, let's now talk about algebraic models. And let's later on combine the two. So algebraic models for finite groups are really not that difficult. So the connection is we're trying to get from topology between topology and algebra. Right? That's the idea that is already visible there. And the first theorem that I want to mention is by Greenings and May. And a part of it algebraically was done by Tevinas and Webb. Uh, there's an accent here. Um, so that one sa says that if I take rational G spectra, the homotopy category of that thing is going to be uh, equivalent to graded rational Mackey functors. And that actually splits as a product of uh, conjugacy classes of subgroups of G of the graded Q W G H modules. So we already have seen the Weil group today. So this is this guy is the normalizer of H mod H. So reflecting this, so maybe I should say Greenleys and May really use the eigenpotence of the rational Burnside ring to do that splitting and connected it to the G spectra, rational G spectra. Tevinas and Webb had a more algebraic, purely algebraic approach for that splitting, but they also did it around the same time. So, modeling this result, we do have a, an algebraic model for the underlying category, model category, infinity category of rational G spectra. And I should mention here Barnes and myself. Um, remember, everywhere here G is finite, that is very important. So there exists an algebraic model for the uh, rational G spectra, so I'm going to form it like this. There is a zigzag of colon equivalences, and in fact, those are symmetric monoidal colon equivalences going to the product, same looking product. Um, and this time our chain complexes of QWGH modules. So you can take that with a projective model structure and that tells you that basically whenever you have, well the symmetric monoidal colon equivalence tells you that whenever you have um, are a ring in rational G spectra, um, our modules are going to correspond to, well, I didn't give it a name, let's give it a name, theta, theta R modules on the other side, and actually monoids <coughs> in here are going to correspond to monoids in here. How explicit is this theta R? Very good question. It's absolutely not explicit. So it's more of an existence result. It's a little bit of a pain. Um, but I'm going to say something about it. Or well, maybe now it's a good time to actually say something about it. Uh, the one thing that we know is if I take the, um, which way let's, let's say, X is going to be a rational G spectrum. Um, if I take theta of x, um, so I need to give it at the spot h, 
So that's what is that's theta h at x. If I take the homology groups of that chain complex, I'm going to get back the homotopy groups of the geometric fixed points, h geometric fixed points of x. Okay, so that's what you know. But what is exactly theta h of x? That you don't know. We're going to come back to that. That's going to be important. I think there's one more thing that I wanted to mention here before I go any further. Namely, um, we can look at that category and we can rewrite that as functors from the orbit category of G with only isomorphisms to rational chain complexes. So, the orbit category of D, um, that's going to have object orbits, so G mod edges, for all subgroups of G, and the morphisms are going to be equivariant maps. So, the left multiplication of G on the orbit and equivariant maps. If I'm taking with a cross, that means I'm only taking isomorphisms. So now you're looking at those two things and thinking, okay, so for every subgroup H, I am going to have an orbit G mod H, and that's going to correspond to my factor in the product. And now the isomorphisms that come in here, those are going to be the final group actions uh, on the orbit, so they are coming here, right? This is, this is encoded, the isomorphisms are encoded here, the different orbits are encoded here. And there's a reason why I wanted to define it that way, or rewrite it that way, the reason is going to be obvious a little bit later. So now, I mentioned this corollary about R modules and monoids, so the question that it's leading towards is what happens with commutative monoids, right? I was talking about those levels of commutativity, what happens then? So, I already mentioned that we have different levels of commutativity on the left-hand side, what happens, what do they correspond to on the right hand side? So I'm in a rational chain complex setting. So in here, something is commutative or it's not. I mean, something is infinity or it's not. It's like, I don't have many levels of commutativity here visible. So what is this corresponding? What happens here? Actually, um, we, well, I need to erase the board to be able to continue. <coughs> Of that group and this one has an action of that group. That's your setting. 
But the, the beauty of that result in here and the beauty of the one um, that is stated at the top there is that you all know how complicated the Mackie factors are in general, right? The maps, the, the restrictions and the transfer maps, they go both ways and the structure is quite complicated. In here, this splitting allows us to sort of separate the information. As simple as it gets, basically. Okay, so our big question, we had rational G spectra, many levels of commutativity. I'm going to call the right hand side there A of G, so that's my algebraic model, and that has one level of commutativity. So the question is, what happens here? And, well, <clears throat> You know what happens? Well, you can probably imagine what happens. Um, that's the result Barnes, Greenlees, and myself. The most naive level of commutativity here is going to correspond to the commutative objects in here. Okay, that algebraic model, as it's stated, sees only the, the most naive level of commutativity. So, I'm going to phrase it as such, infinity algebras in rational G spectra are cool and equivalent to commutative algebras in the algebraic model. So let's unpack that. Those are going to be products over the conjugacy classes of subgroups of G of CDGAs uh, over Q WGH. So a little word of warning here. The tensor product in the algebraic model is taken over Q. It's not taken over Q WGH. I mean, you don't know anything about WGH, so you don't even know if this is going to be commutative. So that's not the structure that we want. We're keeping the tensor product here over Q. So this is really a rational CDGA with a WG action, um, WGH action as CDGA, so on CDGA. Um, okay, and let me rewrite that in a similar way as I did the previous one, namely, this is going to be the functors from this orbit category on G with only isomorphism to CDGA over Q. Okay, so that's a little bit, well, that's not as nice as we would like it to be, but let's have a look at an example. So what happens if we take the K theorem? So here we go. Here is our first theorem of B, H, I, K, M. Yes, I think that's correct. Um, so in here I'm going to assume that G is a finite abelian group. And I'm going to comment on this abelian if I don't forget. Um, so I'm still using that functor here and I'm denoting it by the same theta. It's the same thing uh, as it was before. So I'm going to tell you what happens if I take uh, theta h on the rational equivariant KU. Okay? Well, there is one thing that I forgot to mention. Let's do it here. It's not very good for use. I actually wanted to mention uh, the Seagull's computation before I get that on KU. We know what is the Mackey function of homotopy groups on the rational equivalent KU. And that is going to be given by the complex representation ring Mackey functor on G, um, rationalized with the bot element plus minus one. So that's something that I wanted to mention. Um, 
And now with this in place, let me just say what we have here. Uh, so this one is going to have quite a nice description. It's going to be the field extension of Q by the end primitive, primitive root of unity with the bot element as always if my H is uh, Cn, so the cyclic group of order n, and it's zero otherwise. So it's not going to see anything other than cyclic groups. And for the cyclic groups, it's going to have this simple um, form. So let me just mention the idea of the proof here. Well, one more thing. Um, I didn't tell you what the vial group actions are on this on this thing. The vial group actions are going to be trivial. And that's where the abelian comes in. If the group was not abelian, the, the vial group actions would act through permuting the roots of unity. But if the group is abelian, then the vial group actions act trivially on that thing. And that is going to be important in the proof. So what do we do? Well, what do we do? We first calculate the homology of the geometric fixed points of KU GQ. And, well, we already, well, I already wrote it before, this is going to be the same as the homotopy of the geometric H fixed point, sorry, that was supposed to be theta H. That's the homotopy of the geometric H fixed points of KU GQ. And you're using that description, the square Siegel's computations, and what do you do? If you want to actually compute the geometric fixed points, or the homotopy groups of the geometric fixed points, you're trying to strip off the um, input coming from smaller subgroups. So what you do at the level of Mackey functors, you're basically quotienting your level H, so at the G mod H, you're quotienting by the whatever comes from the lower subgroups by the additive transfer. You're just forgetting about it, forgetting about it. And that's why this thing is going to end up being the homology. So that thing is going to um, that thing is going to be whatever I wrote here. If H is C N and zero otherwise. But that's on homology. So one, one of the things that uh, plays an input here is the Artin, Artin's uh, theorem about complex representations rationally. So rationally, if I look at the complex representation ring for G, um, every complex representation for G, uh, well, that ring is subjected on from the cyclic subgroups of G by induction. So that's that's the Artin's theorem that plays a role here. Um, this computation only tells you about homology of that image, but we would like to know the image itself. So the one thing that you do here... Why, why is that actually the homology? Is that Sorry? Why is that actually the answer for the homology? Is that yeah, so, so there, there are computations here that go into it, mm -hmm. but um, you're starting with the representation ring of um, G, mm -hmm. uh, and at every point you're stripping off the induction from smaller subgroups. And the point is that if your subgroup was not cyclic, then the Artin theorem tells you that everything in your subgroup was coming from cyclic subgroups below. So if you quotient by that, you get zero. But if your subgroup was cyclic, then you know you quotient it out. Well, you quotient it out by the input of smaller cyclic subgroups. But there is one yourself, like there's a subgroup that you're at, that is remaining, and that is after computations that that is the answer. Basically, there's there are some computations going into here. Um, so, um, I started saying, you use formality. So this thing is going to be easy enough that it's going to be formal. And what do I mean by that? Well, you're doing the brute force formality. You are, you have your theta h 
KUGQ on one hand, and on the other hand you have its homology. And what you do, you construct a causal complex in between. So, <coughs> the beauty of this algebraic model, the fact that every point is separated, means that you can do it separately for every of those <coughs> points. They don't have to, you know, you can make choices for every of these uh, chain complexes separately. They don't have to match in any way. And what do you do? So let me give you an example um, for this particular one. So if I take Q, C, N, beta plus minus 1, if that's my homology, then the guy that I've constructed here, well, what do I do? I, I just do the causal complex. So I need to present this Xi N as the nth primitive root of unity. So I'm going to take one generator X in degree 0, I'm going to take one generator, let's call it, uh, sorry, the exterior on one generator Z in degree 1, and I'm going to express that X is really um, representing Xi N in homology. So I'm going to say that the differential on Z is going to be the cyclotomic nth polynomial on X. So I'm expressing that X is in homology is going to be xi n. And then I'm tensoring that guy with the guy that remembers beta. So this time I'm going to take two generators gamma and gamma bar. So this is going to be in degree 2, this is going to be in degree minus 2, and there's going to be a guy in degree 1. So again, exterior in degree 1, that cannot be called z again. Exterior in degree 1, and I'm going to express that on homology, gamma is supposed to be an inverse to gamma bar. So, this guy I'm going to refer to later on. That somehow independently can remember the beta. And uh, the first one is freely, freely resolving the xi n. The important bit for this brute force argument here was that your group was abelian, uh, so that I don't have any val group actions on homology. I might still have a val group action, some non trivial val group action on here, but the point is that on homology, the val group action is going to be trivial. So that means every time I'm making choices for my homology class representatives, I can average. So if I made a choice and it was a wrong choice, it had a G action, like it was not fixed by G, I can take the whole orbit and average over the orbit, and I'm going to have a G fixed element. So I really don't have to worry about G actions uh, when I'm making those things. Okay? So that was one of the important bits where the abelian comes from in the picture. Well, I mean, 
mean, if I have another object, which I know is E infinity 1 algebra in rational G spectra, and I know that uh, the homotopy groups as the Mackey functor of X are abstractly isomorphic to the homotopy groups of KUG Q. So those are as graded Mackey functors or green functors. Abstract isomorphism, then X is weakly equivalent as E infinity 1 algebra to KUG Q. That's what I mean by the uniqueness. Okay, so let's talk about the genuine commutativity because that is more interesting. Right model, you can see that we need more structure to capture the norm maps on homotopy groups. Right? So that's what you're expecting, or what we call the shadows of the norm maps. So this is a theorem due to Vermeer, and it says that if I take a look at this highest level of commutativity in rational G spectra, then I'm going to have an equivalence of infinity categories with um, the functors from orb G to, well, let's call it like that. Oh, sorry, not CDJs. So, let's have a look at what is what is this orb G? This orb G is the full orbit category. So in particular, I'm going to have for K a subgroup of H, I'm going to have the natural quotient of G mod K into onto G mod H. So this is the difference between what happened before when we took the orb G with a cross and what, what is happening now? There's this additional structure of the maps joining our points. So let's come back to our example. And there's no up on this ball. There's no up. The norms are rising the degree. So uh, if G is CP squared, then we had a picture as before. So this part is already as it was. I had that action. I had CP squared mod CP with the same thing acting and I have CP squared mod CP squared and now what is the new part that came in? The new part here are those norm maps joining different points, okay? So this is orb G. So the white one is the old one, we already had it, we already saw that in the naive level, and the red one is the new part. And you should really think about it as, sorry, sorry, shadows of the norm maps on homotopy groups. <coughs> I'm perhaps a little surprised if you think about it, on homotopy groups norms actually do jump the degree. Uh, in here, those are maps, I mean, looking at this description, those are maps of CGGA, so in particular, they are not jumping any degree. And the point is that after you strip all the information coming from the lower subgroups, so you're really only taking the uh, geometric fixed points, the norm maps are going to preserve the degree. Like, you, you got rid of the junk, and all is, all is better behave then. Um, okay, and they are in the second bit, so um, not jumping the degrees, the first surprising thing, but the second surprising thing is those are actually maps of CDGAs. Again, norm maps were multiplicative, but they were not uh, ring ones. And after you strip the uh, input from the lower subgroups, they become so. 
Okay, so now let's uh, have a look at the K theory. So this is again B H I K M. We're only missing out. Um, so if I take a look at this time homology of theta h k u g q, I'm going to separate the two things. In the first thing, I already jumped into what the image is in the algebraic model here. I'm now talking only about the homology to start with. So it is what it was before. Value at any given point did not change naturally. Still has to be abelian, I assume. Uh, yes, in here G, G is abelian. Um, in here, no, uh, G, G is um, uh, finite. Since I don't use formality just yet, it's enough for G to be finite. Yes, and the only other thing that I need to tell you about here is where are the norms. So the norms are going to go from some subgroup CN to CNM since I don't need to consider any subgroups which are not cyclic. So, I apologize for this. Um, so this is a map from here to here. And it does what you think it does. So it's going to send my nth primitive root of unity to the nth root of unity in here, and the beta is sent to beta. So it is an inclusion of graded fields. And in fact, the proof that this is the norm map for the homology on K-theory, um, the proof goes as follows. It cannot be anything else. <laughs> Those are graded fields. I mean, instead of going to be zero, it's going to be that. It's not going to be zero, so it has to be that up to an isomorphism. So that was the idea of the proof. <laughs> okay. So let's let's talk about this uniqueness because that's where we had it. We're heading for the uniqueness of K theory in this new algebraic model or using this new algebraic model Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Go on, Paul. I believe you're true. <laughs> <laughs> I could have envisioned some sort of twist on the bottom. No. <laughs> uh, if it's obvious that there's no trace on the white element, um, I mean, up to an isomorphism, you can just at that point do whatever you want and carry it through the diagram, and you are going to get an isomorphic diagram. So. So let's get this uniqueness. Okay. Yeah. So all of this you could have done for families, maybe, where where then the first one would be these two would be special cases where you have the family of no subgroups and all subgroups. I mean, I don't think I understand the question. Is there a family version of these results where you of the algebraic models yeah, yeah, results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have the intermediate algebraic models. I see. So uh, that's actually probably not exactly a question, but, but if I take any of the intermediate and infinity operas, mm. we all know what the answer should be. It should remember those shadows of the norms that were encoded by that opera. So some of those red things are going to be there and some of those are not going to be there. But there are technical difficulties of uh, how to really obtain that algebraic model. So I'm going to have a student working on it, mm. poor thing. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, um, but in this sense, the, the, the bottom one and the top one are much better behaved. Um, yeah. 
I also had another student working on something like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so where were we? We were at, so I said that previously that was a theorem or corollary. In this situation, that is really a theorem. It's not a straightforward corollary. B H I K M. Um, so I'm just going to write the similar thing that I wrote before genuine. Uh, commutative ring G structure on K U G Q is unique. And again, what do I mean by that? I.e., if I have another object that I know is genuine commutative in rational G spectra, and I know that again the Mackey functors or the green functors um, of that thing are going to be abstractly isomorphic to the ones for KUG, then X, X is weakly equivalent as E infinity G algebras to KUG. So all this additional Norm structure that you expect is actually already determined at the values at every point. Nothing weird can happen there. No, G is really. Yes, G is, sorry, G is a bit. Find it a bit, yeah. Thank you. Let's have a look at time. Oh, wonderful. Um, so, I'm going to just comment very briefly about the idea of the proof. Uh, looking at what we've done before, you know what you're expecting. You're expecting formality result. So, formality, so you expect to join the image of the K-theory in this new algebraic model with its homology. So some kind of a zigzag of weak equivalences in that algebraic model. And I'm going to say that you do formality in a very beautiful way, by brute force. <laughs> so, you basically, um, without giving any details, you're constructing again the middle term with weak equivalences in both sides. But this time, it is much harder, because you are working over diagrams, and the diagrams are indexed by the orbit category of G. So, as you go up on your subgroup lattice of G, you have to carry up more and more information coming from the bar. So, it's not going to be independent formality at every spot as it was before. Now you have to carry this information from the lower subgroups. So, let me leave it at that without giving any, uh, any more details. Uh, the one thing that I wanted to mention, it is important that we assuming X is already having all this additional structure. Because there are some examples of X which are only E infinity 1 and they do have this abstract isomorphism but they, them, they, they themselves cannot have a higher level of commutativity. Okay, So that bit is important. And I also wanted to mention, perhaps finishing, remarks. Uh, Baker and Richter um, proved uniqueness of E infinity structure um, on KU, so this is the non equivariant and before rationalization, and they used obstruction theory. We do not have equivariant obstruction theory to run with it. So somehow the algebraic model compensates a little bit for that. But if you have a look at the paper or all the things that I mentioned, the formality is really important. So the algebraic model is going to work up to a certain point. Um, the KU had a particularly simple image in the algebraic model, so you could still run that business. If with anything more complicated, I don't think we're going to have much chance. Uh, the abelian 
uh, assumption was important throughout this, this talk. I mean, it came every time I needed to do formality, because I, as I mentioned, I was doing formality by brute force. If I have some non-trivial G action on homology, if I try to freely resolve it, I am going to have cycles. That's just by definition, right? It's going to come back to itself. So I cannot do brute force arguments in there. So is the theorem not right for arbitrary groups, so or you just can't prove it? Uh, say, say it again. Is the theorem, would the theorem possibly still be true for arbitrary finite G? Or? For arbitrary finite G, no, I need a billion here. So the theorem wouldn't be true? Um, or, or no, I, I cannot true? prove it. Okay. Okay. That's that's a different statement. Yeah, I, I cannot, but we cannot prove it. Do you think it's true anyway? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, really K theory is uh, as good as it gets. Uh, and I wanted to finish with an example because you might think, okay, perhaps everything is going to have such a uniqueness result. Perhaps nothing interesting is actually happening. No, that's not quite true. Let's take CP squared again. And let's have a look at um, the little KU. So the connective cover of this thing. So without giving, well, we know what, what the answers are going to be, but I'm just going to draw them as dots. Uh, so this is CP squared mod E, CP squared mod CP, and this is CP squared mod CP squared. So those are going to be the values for my KU GQ. And now, what can happen for the highest levels of commutativity? So what, what levels of commutativity I can have on that? Actually, I can have four different non-weakly equivalent uh, homotopy types for this particular one. What can I do? Well, something that I couldn't do before, namely, well, if I'm going to take the yellow ones, that means beta goes to zero. So that map, we know what the values are. The values are the same, except for beta doesn't have the, the beta doesn't have the inverse. So on the level zero, I have inclusions of fields, and then I'm deciding where do I send beta. So I'm telling you here, you send beta to zero and beta to zero. That's a perfectly good map. That's one of the um, homotopy types which forgets down to the Mackey functor of this thing. The other one would be, well, to take the beta goes to beta here and beta goes to zero here. Well, you see the pattern, so... And finally... And perhaps I shouldn't have said that what, what happens with KUGQ because we actually know that KUGQ is this one. It's the connective cover of whatever we had before, so really beta goes to beta on all of those things. Those three are some other commutative rings. We just happen to have the same Mackey functor, or green functor, if you wish, but they do something else with the norms. So with this, I think I'm going to finish. Thank you.